Apologies for multi source. Okay. There we go. <laughs> Welcome to the session two uh, for methodologies for multi-source processes. Um, this is a very important topic. Most NSIs are moving to alternative data sources to supplement their national uh, statistical systems and outputs to varying degrees of success. Uh, there have been a series of SNETs sponsored by Eurostat and I know very heavily involved uh, ISTAT in these initiatives to develop new methods and promote best practice in multi-source statistics. Particularly in the United Kingdom, where I'm based, um, they're moving now towards uh, administrative data first. And they have to make a recommendation to the national uh, statistician um, on uh, ability to use administrative data in their um, censuses and national statistics. And for them, of course, it's very challenging because they don't have a population register so obviously in the countries with population registers, they have better um, success. But it's not just about administrative data, and we'll hear later today uh, by David uh, Haziza on integrating non-probability samples. So there is certainly a need to think about non-probability surveys as coming in, into prominence in survey statistics these days uh, due to very de um, you know large uh, decrease in response rates and the difficulties in in uh, surveying hard to capture groups and so I think this is a very promising area of research. Um, certainly, well planned non probability surveys I think do have a place in survey statistics. So hopefully we'll hear more of that later. But um, there's still a lot of work to do, uh, not just in using multiple data sources to produce estimates and we've seen already small area estimation techniques, mass imputation, model-based estimates, but also, as we can see, the um, problem or the re much research needed to assess the quality, you know, the mean square errors, confidence intervals, et cetera, so a large um, area of research there. So we're going to hear uh, two papers. The first is the overview of the ESTAT activities and open problems, 15 minutes. I'm going to stick to time. Um, and then uh, going back to the ALE, the attained level of education, uh, looking at neural networks uh, for imputation. Um, and that will be the next paper. And then Thomas Berg from Statistics Austria will have an overview of new approaches on the topic and provide a discussion. And finally, the point of view of the statistical production department. So uh, with no further ado, let's start with Stefano overview of the ISTAT activities and open problems. Thank you. And uh, this is a paper with uh, Marco Dizio and Silvio Loriga in which we um, give an overview of uh, of the main uh, research line uh, within uh, this topic. In particular, these topics, uh, we, um, we um, uh, describe, illustrate some uh, research line within uh, the context uh, of uh, uh, the uh, quality aspects, because we, um, uh, this topic is strictly related to uh, quality uh, by design topic. So we have uh, also, in the description of the census we have just already done is uh, the emblematic case of, um, uh, in the emblematic case of multi-source estimation process uh, and uh, similar process like census, uh, population census, uh, uh, may be um, um, developed, may be produced for, uh, uh, for example, for other census like agricultural census uh, and other um, permanent sensors of this type. We have the three pieces of information, integrated system register, 
new population census and census and social service. So we have the service and the register. And they are, uh, we want to uh, obtain by means of integration of this information, more accurate and more current estimates or uh, exploiting the different available sources that uh, in the different contexts may play the role of primary, primary sources of information or secondary sources. Uh, they, um, uh, we have to investigate uh, uh, what, uh, what uh, could be the role of a secondary source uh, and in what, uh, in what way we can act in this case. And here we have two uh, diagrams relating to census, uh, in which we describe the input and output flows of information, in which we have administrative data and um, sample data, and the, as uh, input flows and output flows are variables of the different topics, also including auxiliary variables. The same, uh, the second diagram stress the uh, production process, process for register variables and uh, um, survey variables in which uh, um, auxiliary uh, administrative information play the role of uh, um, in, in, the second, uh, in the second scheme, uh, re, uh, administrative variables uh, play the role of auxiliary information uh, uh, versus the prime, the upper, um, upper scheme in which uh, the sample play the role of supporting information. Um, the idea, the general idea is of quality by the same framework within the multi-source uh, context. Uh, in our idea is uh, the quality is a holistic approach in which quality represents the goal to be pursued in all the phases of the statistical process uh, from the design, the definition of uh, uh, objective of the surveys to the output phase. Um, in this context, uh, multiple, uh, multiple social approach, uh, uh, taking into account the accuracy, um, we uh, have uh, in this uh, holistic approach uh, the possibility to link together the different phases of the project, so of the, of the process. Uh, for example, data collection, uh, uh, data collection issues uh, may be uh, crucial for uh, uh, to to uh, to get the success of uh, um, 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 uh, of uh, sample surveys aimed to support uh, uh, the the process. Uh, uh, on the other end, a single source approach. Uh, in the single source approach, everything is planned for the single process, and measurement error, no responses, and under coverage, and in general, non and also the design of the process may affect may affect. Uh, significant difference, uh, differences among the um, uh, estimates, produced estimates. Um, in, in this, um, in this, uh, then we uh, um, make some uh, um, illustration, uh, general illustration of three uh, lines of research. The first two really are related to register-based statistics, uh, in particular uh, the choice of primary and secondary sources, uh, and uh, um, one topic that we have just uh, um, touched in the previous section that, that is related to evaluation, a crucial aspect that is the evaluation of uncertainty of register-based statistics within the integrated system registers. And the other one is the possibility to improve the accuracy and coherence of the 
um, this is uh, to the, uh, the census and social survey integrated system, uh, exploiting the information coming from uh, uh, master sample for the second phase surveys from master sample and all, uh, as well all, um, information coming from registers. Uh, the choice of uh, primary and secondary sources. Uh, in, within the context of multi-source uh, context, uh, instead of the, um, deciding if uh, uh, administrative data or um, sample data uh, are alternative uh, uh, um, sources of information, within this context, uh, we uh, consider the exploitation of the different sources of information together, but we have to decide uh, what is the primary information, the information that from which uh, we derive uh, uh, the estimates of interest. The other information coming from other data, area level data or sampling data or uh, what else, um, is uh, um, 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 the other information is, is secondary in the sense that supports uh, the information coming from support the primary information. So uh, it is uh, um, uh, too many issues to consider. How much the variable in the register represents the target variable? So the definition of the target variable is if we have the same definition in the administrative uh, register and to which extent the observed part of the data is representative of the population in the case of we have a sample. It is useful to refer to the paper uh, in Meng, in which uh, we do not have a, a multi-source approach that we uh, uh, exploit together this type of information, giving them different strengths, but uh, it compares uh, to a type of information. One coming from a sample that may be affected by no response, uh, and the one coming from a non-probabilistic uh, or, for example, a big data sample, and uh, the aim is to reply to a uh, general question, which one should I trust more? A 1% one, a 1 survey with 60% 60, 60 response rate, or a self-reported administrative data covering 80% of the population? This is one of the basic questions of that a survey manager may pose to a statistician when asking for the proper use of administrative data. In this context, uh, it's useful the, the general, uh, the general uh, um, expression giving, uh, given by, uh, uh, given in the paper, in which the mean square error uh, may be viewed as, um, as uh, composed by three factors. The, the, the first factor is expected value under the uh, selection or selection mechanism. Selection, if we have in the context of sample um, uh, sampling in the traditional sampling um, asset, otherwise we can uh, also uh, missing uh, derived from a uh, non probability. Uh, uh, dealing of a sample mechanism. So we have the expected under this, uh, uh, the uh, R pro, uh, R, the observation selection process of the correlation coefficient, the square of the correlation coefficient uh, between target variable and the process. <coughs> that is called the data defect, data defect uh, index. Then we have uh, the uh, dropouts of index uh, related to the data quantity, how much, of, uh, how much observation we have with respect to population, and then what is called, um, the first one is data quality, the second one is data effect, is data 
quantity, and the uh, second, third one is uh, uh, data. Okay is data um, uh, difficulty, depending on the variability of interest. In this context, uh, I have not so uh, time to enter in details, but uh, uh, the general idea is that even if a uh, uh, very low correlation, uh, in when we have a non-probabilistic uh, sample, a very low correlation, uh, of the um, between the R um, the R process and the, the target variable may be uh, weighted with the um, size of the population. So um, so um, the final data in the slides uh, I discuss are just a, a simple example in which we make a comparison between a sample of 50% of the Italian population with, this, uh, uh, with uh, uh, um, uh, effective sample size with uh, referred to uh, the um, uh, uh, sample of four, uh, 400 units. So um, the, the final uh, conclusion uh, is that uh, if the uh, data defect for a non-probabilistic sample is small, the effect of, is, uh, the, uh, the effect of this uh, small correlation coefficient is magnified by the population size. Um, it is necessary to think about those issues because we notice uh, that if we, if we do not control, we, uh, we do not control the response observation mechanism, uh, the fact that uh, the sample size is, is big can be uh, even counterproductive because we put more trust on biased data, data because in, we have to, uh, to face with bias in the numerator, numerator of this formula. Then uh, to, to, find, uh, to end with this uh, topic, uh, we say that the bigger the data, the surer we foul ourselves. A sense of uncertainty of register-based statistics. The other topic within register-based uh, uh, statistics is related to uh, crucial aspects assess of assessing a certainty of statistics with multi-source data. Particularly, it is important in order to um, in, in order to uh, use uh, to increase the ability of registered data. Um, uh, assigning to each uh, statistic, uh, to each uh, statistics their uh, proper uh, value of accuracy. Uh, in sample survey, we have the classical atomization of the sign bias approach in order to present, to evaluate also with synthetic presentation of the error, the variance. But within uh, um, uh, register based uh, variables, we have to uh, derive uh, a general way or to rules or a general way to act. In this context, as we as said before in the discussion, we are going to make uh, a comparative analysis between, uh, in the context, uh, applicative context of the census, between different uh, uh, methodologies proposed uh, for this uh, aim. Now we, uh, you can have a list of this uh, on this. Uh, okay. The last one is uh, how to gain uh, um, in the, uh, another problem of uh, um, is related to how to obtain efficiency and uh, um, improve efficiency and coherence within the context of uh, census integrated. Uh, um, social survey system in which we can uh, utilize uh, uh, first phase uh, uh, data and also registered data to, um, to get more coherence and more uh, uh, efficiency, exploiting uh, first phase uh, auxiliary data as auxiliary, but also registered, basic, uh, registered data 
and uh, also to um, to get uh, to um, to weigh the information to give priority to this information in order to to get uh, a more coherent uh, uh, figures from this one um, in this context um, uh, I, um, this is the topic, uh, and uh, um, um, in this context, I have just the time to stress uh, some final research topic, uh, other than that uh, I have uh, uh, seat, uh, already seen uh, the Our um, research activities and challenges for the future are completing the methodological framework and implementation of the existing and new register, defining, defining the final asset of the second phase, study for population search or master sample of adaptive survey design using a KWI contact sim with CAPI subsample of CAPI non respondent, and to improve small area methods, uh, exploiting data uh, even over time or from, uh, uh, from uh, using spatial patterns. In particular, it is important also to uh, um, uh, decide in this last consideration if um, uh, we want uh, the, if uh, sampling information if in the future uh, may become uh, may become a support only a support for the register based uh, information like uh, uh, in order to in, in this case uh, the planet the, the sample uh, uh, played uh, will could play the role in future when uh, uh, auxiliary when uh, administered could uh, play the role when uh, auxiliary information uh, um, when administered information uh, could be more developed to uh, a role of audit but uh, in this case we come back to the initial slide of the uh, initial slide of my presentation in which uh, it is very important in this context uh, to uh, define uh, quality in an holistic approach, linking all uh, together the different phases uh, of the process. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll move directly to the next paper. Rom uh, Romina Filippini, a study of uh, neural networks um, for the imputation of ALEs. Thank you. This work uh, regards a study of a multilayer perceptron for the imputation of the attended level of education in the base register of individuals. This work was possible thanks to the close cooperation between different ISTAT colleagues with different skills, who are Fabrizio De Fausti, Marco Di Zio, Simona Toti, and uh, Diego Zardetto. This is the outline of uh, the presentation. To focus the motivation of this work, it is important to uh, understand the context and the characteristics of the data set on which we are working. Then I will briefly introduce the use of sampling weights in surveys and the methods used to process this uh, data. Then there will be a description of the experimental study and finally results and uh, some conclusion. Uh, the attained level of uh, education of the permanent Italian census, that we refer here as uh, AIL, uh, relies on a high amount of uh, administrative information. But these information are characterized by coverage gaps and delay of information. So it is necessary to resort to sample survey data. Uh, for the estimation of uh, AIL for all the Italian resident population, ISTAT adopted a mass imputation approach that integrates administrative and uh, survey data. The procedure is based on a sequence of uh, log linear imputations. So due to the complexity and the heterogeneity of the available information, 
The solution of the problem with the standard statistical methods requires an in-depth knowledge of the data structure and uh, an expensive initial phase of data analysis and uh, treatment with a strong effort in terms of human uh, intervention. So the aim of this work is uh, to experiment the use of alternative approaches to make the process more automated. In recent years, uh, machine learning techniques have been applied in different contexts, uh, mainly when we have to do with uh, um, large um, uh, data sets, da data sets with different, uh, different uh, types. Uh, machine learning techniques are characterized by a more automatic approach uh, uh, to the data. So this uh, opportunity uh, lead uh, the motivation of this uh, work that is based on an experimentation of the, to the use of a multilayer perceptron with the twofold objective of reducing uh, human workload, so to make the process less costly in terms of uh, human resources and possibly improving the estimation accuracy. Uh, in um, terms of modernization of uh, statistics, there's a strong push in introducing uh, machine learning technique in the production uh, process. So in 2019, the high-level group for the modernization of official statistics of the UNEC launched a machine learning project with the aim of investigating the use of machine learning for official statistics. So whether machine learning could um, produce more timely, accurate, and reliable estimates. ISTAT as well worked uh, on this uh, high-level group, uh, particularly on the topic of uh, editing and uh, imputation. And uh, as regards uh, imputation, ISTAT worked on a comparison between the official imputation approach for the estimation of AIL, which is based on uh, log linear models, and the multilayer perceptron model. The results of this work uh, was recently published in the statistical journal of the IAOS. Um, but uh, since the AIL distribution on the Italian resident population is a standard output of the yearly permanent Italian census, a good estimate of the AIL frequency distribution is uh, crucial. And an important quality dimension is the ability of the uh, estimation processes to produce good frequency distributions. So uh, we extended our initial study on the use of uh, the multilayer perceptron model to include sampling weights, that uh, sampling weights have the role to make the sample representative of the entire population. So this, is, uh, this table summarizes the structure of the available information. So we have core information um, that are available for all the individual in the reference population. Then we have administrative sources that are available only for a subset of our population, but these administrative sources provide very important information on AIL and course attendance. For individuals that are not, in, uh, not covered from administrative sources, we use the 2011 census. Um, both information um, are delayed with respect to the reference uh, time, and the only information available in reference time T on AIL comes from the census survey that, uh, the census survey that takes place every year uh, in Italy and covers about the 5% of the population of interest. So we have different patterns of information that determine the partition of the population of interest into three subgroups. The main difference is between group A and the others. Group A is composed by active people for which we know the course attendance in the um, uh, last years. So only this information, this administrative information is used to um, estimate the attained level of education. And we do not use uh, AIL observed in the census sample. While in group B and C that are composed by inactive people, um, we use uh, AIL observed in the census sample in time t as response variables, uh, variable in uh, our models. And uh, in this case, the aim is to reproduce the AIL distribution observed in the census sample within profiles to the other uh, individual not observed in the census sample. 
So in this experimentation, um, the data set is composed only by the subpopulations B and C. We use only one Italian region, specifically the Lombardia region, and we use only individuals with no missing data on the target variable. So only individuals uh, oops, um, that are present in the census uh, sample. So it is always possible to compare the estimated ale with the observed ale. Uh, the data set is composed by about 300,000 uh, individuals. So the National Statistical Institute uh, routinely carry out probability survey sample, and uh, this means to use complex sampling design and the computation of uh, unequal survey weights due to the joint effect of uh, different inclusion probabilities and sometimes the use of auxiliary information to adjust weights, uh, for example, uh, for uh, total non-responses. So in the standard approach, survey weights are used directly in estimates or they are incorporated into the estimators. So in the official procedure, um, the model estimated for ale imputation includes survey weights. This means that the log linear models are uh, estimated on weighted counts. As regards the machine learning approach, the inclusion of survey weights has uh, received little attention in literature. This is mainly due to the fact that machine learning usually produces uh, micro-level estimates. In this case, we want to reproduce um, the distribution of ale observed in the census sample properly weighted. So we introduce the use of sampling weight also in the multilayer perceptron approach. And in particular, we use the loss function weighted with the sampling uh, weights. So for each uh, individual, the um, difference distance between the true and the predicted uh, value of ale is multiplied by the sampling weight. So as if we were considering um, the population. So these are the methods with which we process our data. The official uh, procedure, which is based on uh, log linear uh, model, this means to um, model the association between variables. And uh, for each subpopulation, the conditional probabilities are estimated on weighted count data. And then ale is imputed by randomly taking a value from this distribution. As regards the machine learning, we apply a multilayer perceptron model. And in this case, we do not need to divide the population into subgroups, but just one single neural network is trained. We use the weighted loss function, and then ale is imputed by randomly taking a value from the distribution. This is a small but uh, important modification with respect to the standard use of multilayer perceptron that usually considers only the modal value. But in, uh, in, in this case, we wanted to rep better reproduce macro level estimates. So we randomly take a value from uh, the estimated distribution, like in the log linear uh, process. The multilayer perceptron was applied in two different experimentations. Um, in the first experimentation, we used the same input variables used in the log linear model. In this case, the aim is to minimize confounding factors, so to allow a net comparison between the two methods. In a second experimentation that we refer to as MLP all in, all the variables in the data set uh, are included, are used as input in the MLP all-in without any selection or reclassification. So it, in this case, we don't do uh, any variable preprocessment. The aim of this second experimentation is to study the possibility of using a more automated approach. Now, the description of the experimental study. Um, Estimates are computed using a k-fold approach. This means that the data set is partitioned into five subgroups, and the model is estimated on uh, the training set that, that uh, consists of four of the five subgroups. The results are applied on the test set that is composed of the remaining subgroup. These tasks are repeated five times, so at the end we reconstruct the entire data set. Uh, this uh, approach is followed by both the log linear and the multilayer perceptron approach. So, and the results of the estimates are compared with the, the target distribution that is uh, the one observed in the census sample. The methods are evaluated using two quality measures, 
that are concerned with the predictive accuracy of each unit, that is the micro level accuracy, and the accuracy of estimated aggregates. This is a macro level accuracy, and um, in this case, we use a cool back labeler divergence to measure the difference between two uh, distributions. For each model, the process is repeated 100 times so that we can consider the model variability and the resulting indicators are averaged over those uh, 100 repetitions. And now the results in this table, the micro level predictive accuracy is uh, uh, reported for each of uh, the methods and for each of the k fold. Um, in the table, the proportion of individual with the, the um, with the estimated value equal, equal to the true value is reported in percentage. Uh, log linear and MLP show very similar results with an accuracy equal to 71%, while the MLP all in has a slightly higher um, micro accuracy. This second table, we report the macro level accuracy. So the kullback labeler divergence uh, is reported for each uh, method. So here, the distance between the estimated uh, frequency distribution and the true uh, frequency distribution is uh, reported. Also in this case, log linear and MLP show very similar results. And, but uh, the MLP all in, the um, distance between the estimated and the, uh, the true distribution is slightly higher. This is the last uh, table. Uh, here, the macro level accuracy is reported by citizenship. Here, we can notice that for the not Italian uh, subpopulation, the um, accuracy is uh, a little uh, lower than for the Italian subpopulation. The not Italian subpopulation has, is a much smaller population than the Italian one, and for this subpopulation, we have less information available. In general, um, log linear and MLP, again, show very similar uh, results with the small, um, better performance for the log linear model for the Italian subpopulation and the MLP for the not Italian subpopulation. On the other hand, the MLP all in show um, um, higher distances between the observed and the estimated uh, frequency distribution. So to conclude, uh, we did, in this paper, we wanted to investigate the behavior of the multilayer perceptron as a tool for improving quality and, in particular, the efficiency of the statistical process of the estimation of AIL. We used the survey uh, weights uh, in the multilayer perceptron approach, modifying the cross-entropy loss function. And as regards uh, the results, for the imputation of AIL, the results of the MLP uh, the multilayer perceptron are very similar to those originated from the log linear models. This is true for both the micro level accuracy and the macro level estimated frequency distribution. And um, as regards the multilayer perceptron all, e, all in, we can say that this study encourages to deepen the opportunity given by the use of uh, machine learning methods for a more automated approach um, for the prediction of the attained level of uh, education. But further investigation, further investigation is uh, needed. So in future, future work, we want to explore um, other machine learning techniques, and in particular, we want to explore also the opportunity to manage longitudinal information in the multilayer perceptron approach in order to obtain consistent estimates over time. Thank you. Also from the colleague. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to invite Thomas Berg to provide an overview of new approaches on the topic and discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation of being here. It's an honor for me. And in the last week, I had the honor as, as a member of a peer review team to see the Italian statistical system and methodological research is clearly seen as a strength and, strength, and this workshop is also a piece of evidence regarding this strength. Okay, presentation is still there. 
Okay, thank you very much. So I will talk in the next couple of week, uh, minutes a little bit about challenges, producing official statistics, then come to the multi-source scenario, showing you some approaches to tackle that, and uh, then coming to some questions, which might be research questions or questions which are worth of discussing it. So what what are we? We are now in official statistics, and we are facing really uh, some kind of challenges. So we have all seen this, the, the crisis, and luckily the COVID crisis, but as well ongoing, coming from demand crisis or energy crisis. So we have to react in a crisis scenario. We have to do some methodological developments, which are new, new and papers already presented shows us this already. <clears throat> there are changing user demands. Uh, first of all, that we are in an environment which requires us to produce faster and technical innovation is going on and using new data sources and so on. So emerging data needs new data sources we have to deploy and to combine, playing a new role in the, in the national data ecosystem is another issue as well. So acting as a data steward, we have uh, very challenging situations uh, as it regards confidentialities. And the crisis showed that it's not so easy to collect data, even uh, first of all in surveys. The methodological development concerns the use of all data sources, the new methods we need to, to, to use for new, uh, privately held data. And we have to be in this multi-source scenario, we'll come in on that in a few minutes. We have to rely on the new estimation methods and calibration. We have to quality assessment. We have to integrate those data. So increasing user demands. User want to make use of data as soon as possible. So there is some some overlay or some overtaking about the uh, dimension of timeliners and punctuality timeliners first of all to to accuracy, which is as well as some a little bit problematic for the production point of view. There are other producers, so we are coming in a concurrent situation, and the perception to quality has changed at all. And there's as well a, uh, some increased uh, desire to make automated use of data, so that not by machine-to-machine -machine use is, is, is an issue here. Technological information, we have uh, improved IT standards, we have an improved microdata access, we have this API technology, so that's all signs that this technological innovation has to be overcome and as well to, to present visualization tools and new forms of data presentations are now demanded. So now coming to this multi-source uh, scenario, we talk about multi-source scenario in the production of figures, is based to one of more than one of to more than one source, and this is given, I think, not only in a completely integrated uh, statistical world or in a register-based world. This is even uh, present for nearly all statistical products now. So there is hardly been any exception of that, and this is tackles as well that we have a more administrative sources, not more than one. We have a survey, but even at the survey level, uh, I think we do not have single source if we don't have a, a survey, because we are now acting, and since the pandemic, we do it more and more, to rely on multi-mode. So even when having a survey, we have maybe up to three sources. We have the CAPI, the CAVI, and the CAPI, maybe. And we have this whole field of new data sources. What are the approaches we tackle this? This is, uh, of course, this was we have seen here in, in, in the morning session, uh, register integration. Uh, so we have uh, a base register, and we have uh, the base register is supporting the data cleaning, but it is used for the integrated production of statistics. We have uh, here, we use it as well for constructing frames, so for, for sampling. We, we, construct, we, construct, we use it for satellite registers. So this is one approach to have a kind of base register, heavily used in Italy, for instance, making use of a rich portfolio of administrative data sources and to use it then for further processing and even for the production of statistics. Then we have here uh, 
different configurations, as we call it. This slide comes from uh, Deval and uh, others from, on multi-source statistics, and it was well, as well one of the bases for the so-called Comuso project, with, which delivered uh, some very useful results. And uh, we have here different scenarios of uh, quality, of, of uh, quality overlaps and different sources where we have to or can produce statistics out of it. So one approach is uh, to, to here develop estimation and quality assessment according to the corresponding, corresponding scenarios. Another idea is this idea of having a checklist. So this is uh, one, of, uh, one of examples coming out as well from Camuso from work package one of ECR one to have this idea of a checklist regarding to each administrative source. Uh, again, Camuso, so uh, this is just to inform you about uh, what we have here about quality indicators and quality measures. So there is an exhaustive list of examples and uh, uh, and uh, methods regarded to quality indicators and quality measures and as well what we, we uh, what was developed here was uh, quality guidelines for multi-source statistics and frames in official statistics uh, constructing frames in social, social statistics as well based on a multi-source basis uh, what what is another example is uh, to to have here a stage-wise approach for quality assessment. So we have here uh, the, we have here three phases. We have here the raw data registered, uh, provided by the data holders, then combined in, in a central storage in a, in a central database. So we combine this information from the re registers, and we can merge it hopefully by unique key. And we have then final data, including imputation. And this is a picture. Uh, coming from the quality conference, I think in 2016 it was. Uh, so to combine all this information to come to a quality assessment. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, another thing is that we do not have as well uh, only new uh, classical sources like administrative data and so input and uh, survey input. We as well rely on so-called big data sources. And uh, as as well in the European statistical system going on something about developing quality guidelines uh, here to the input phase, to the throughout phase, and to the output phase. And uh, these quality guidelines as well uh, helps do help us or should help us a little bit to uh, come here to new methods. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, what uh, we as well have here is the approach mixed mode as a special form of multi-source. This is uh, from the quality conference in Vilnius very shortly ago where we see different response rates if you, if, uh, given the the uh, size of the of an establishment in a survey and as well uh, broken down after uh, according to the mode used. So integrating new data sources as well, I would like to hint out a little bit that we have here some some differences between uh, uh, between survey data and uh, big data sources. So. First of all, uh, this is uh, quite a different uh, approach. So the survey design relies on other things. And uh, in, the, in the big data source, you have here data processing. And as well, we do not have any more here in the data generation, the normal microdata approach. We have something like nanodata, which is very important. Okay, so points uh, <clears throat> for discussion is the set of <coughs> methodological instruments sufficient for handling the multi-source scenario. 
Can we integrate new data sources sufficiently? And another issue is we saw we see some research here on national basis. We see some research here on European basis, on, on European level. How can we inter organize the common research in this field? So this is quite an interesting question for me. And as well, I want to like to raise an issue here is uh, <clears throat> the quality of administrative sources. Uh, this is quite an important issue. Uh, there are ongoing discussions now in the European statistical system about new roles of national statistical institutes. This regards that national statistical institutes should take tasks which are very new to that of data stewardship. The legal act uh, related to that is the so-called Data Governance Act. And this is kind of, of, of chance. So the question I raise is, could this data stewardship help as well to improve the statistical sources we use, the administrative sources, for statistical use? So this would be a chance as well for yeah, national statistical institutes to play a better role in national data ecosystems. OK, so thank you very much for lending me your ears. <clears throat> Thank you for that very comprehensive the summary of the topics. OK, finally, we have um, uh, uh, Carlo to talk about the point of view of the statistical production department in ISTAT. Thank you, Chair. We have uh, listened to three presentations, which have uh, a lot of points in common. Uh, although very different perspectives. Um, the presentation by Stefano was, uh, had, uh, had, you know, uh, a sort of uh, policy, statistical policy background, uh, while at the same time deepening one aspect which had to do with the choice of uh, which source to take in order to produce official statistics. Um, the paper from um, uh, that, uh, was presented by, by Romina uh, Filippini, uh, entered in, the, in, in one important subject, imputation methods, and uh, the presentation of um, a, an approach based on, uh, on uh, machine learning uh, techniques in order to uh, provide uh, improvements, uh, not just only on quality, but especially on efficiency in the processes. Thomas, as a uh, underlined a lot of uh, aspects, of policy aspects, of research aspects, and uh, the, the clay behind the, the multi-source processes. These all, uh, all these three aspects are very interesting. I want to uh, point in particular uh, on, the, um, on the experiments made by the group of uh, Romina, uh, because uh, um, this kind of approaches look uh, in, uh, look very uh, intriguing in my, on, on my view because uh, uh, obviously we have a, we know that we 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 spend a lot of work in uh, in producing registers. Uh, I know it very well for the register that I am working on, which is the income register, uh, in which we have a lot of sources, not just two, but you know uh, there are several tens of uh, uh, sources and uh, problems of uh, you know integration of these sources which are very very uh, difficult to treat so one of the points uh, for which i would ask also some more deepening on your side is uh, whether uh, what what does it mean efficiency gain i mean the, the part in which we study uh, and anal analyze the, the raw data is very very important so when we use, we pass to machine learning approaches, uh, there, there may be some drawbacks in skipping this part of the exercise, because in this case we are sleep, uh, skipping a part of the learning process that lay beyond the, under, the, behind the understanding of the data and the reality which is behind that. So um, I think uh, it should be more accurate in general to point, point out uh, why should we go uh, engage in such uh, uh, an approach that I like very much, Istintili, 
uh, and how can we manage these drawbacks in learning and uh, uh, knowledge in general. Um, the other point I want to mention is uh, um, uh, one point that which always is, uh, you know, behind the scene. I mean, uh, we, we, we speak about the register, registers are, uh, by definition, should be uh, exhaustive. But we live in a country where there is 15% uh, of the GNP uh, which is uh, uh, un, uh, unobserved, in which we have uh, more than 10% of workforce which is working uh, uh, undeclared. So registers do not measure at all this part, this part of the of the economy, and this should be kept together. I mean, register cannot be exhaustive, and so it is quite obvious what uh, Stefan has just demonstrated very clearly that if we want to measure, for example, employment, we don't have to do anything, nothing else but using uh, the surveys. For first reason, because it is um, very timely. It is the timeliness of surveys is. Uh, uh, cannot be beaten. Uh, but the one point of investment is the use of register to anticipate surveys. Uh, in the, the case of a silk survey is quite evident. I mean, we have a survey which is very difficult, um, uh, which has a relatively small sample, and Italian sample is about 50,000 individuals. We have uh, registers. The registers are, have a time dimension. They are longitudinal information. Uh, efforts should be made in order to anticipate survey estimates by the use of past observation of registers and other registers up to date. And uh, uh, this is the kind of investment that uh, has a, a very important uh, result. And uh, uh, this is uh, uh, as in, uh, so important because you know uh, European regulation is very strict on the, on the date of, uh, of release of data. So this is the point of longitudinality of registers is the one that should be more encouraged in, uh, in all our, uh, our analysis. One last point has to do with uh, the picture we have made of um, our uh, level of uh, attainment in, um, in the production of integrated integra integra production of uh, register statistics. So I, I think uh, uh, we are, sometimes we are very over optimistic sometimes because uh, it seems that uh, we are already with the uh, skin of the bear in our hands, but uh, the bear is still uh, alive and uh, uh, we should uh, uh, in, invest more, more in, uh, in uh, registers and integrity statistics. More or less is that invests 5% of its work, so, uh, workforce in registers uh, in, 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 the, in, the, in the system of registers. And 5% is a very low uh, quantity. So it's a, the point is a cultural passage, which has to be done, um, and which is not uh, an easy passage, uh, especially if uh, there is such a shortage of resources that we are experiment, experiencing in the, the last years dramatically. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you for sticking more or less to time, and uh, we will open the floor now for discussion, questions. Okay, uh, two things. One comment for Stefano. Uh, of course, you see this. this, this I, I'm coming back to the fact that you see the, the big data and the survey and the... So th this is the internal, internal problem of the bias against the variance. The survey will give you maybe no bias or unbiased kind of approach while you will have a variance. The other one, the big data, you will have probably no variance, but you have a bias. And then the, the question is, is you see, are you willing to live with a bias with so many, uh, so many data, or maybe no bias, but the variance? And you see, John Rao was asking me this question about 30 years ago, and, he, uh, and he, of course it was a catch-up. He was saying, you see, look, go with the survey, because the bias you cannot measure the bias while the variance you can do it 
uh, and uh, then he said you should go with the, with the survey. But you raise, you rose a very nice point here, is the fact that uh, in this kind of comment that was there, is that yes, you have a survey, but if your survey has only 20, 30, 40 percent response, then you are in potentially in a biased situation that you cannot compute anymore as well. So the question is that survey against big data, yes, but survey with bias and big data with bias, then this is the kind of problem that we have. So is that better to have a 1% survey with a low response rate that might be presenting potentially biased results or having those super large data set potentially biased as well? So which one is the best? Honestly, I have don't, no answer, but the more and more people are inclined to go with the big data, they are cheaper and so on and so on. So this is the first comment, and maybe you can come back on this, but as well to, to, uh, to Romina, say Romina, say uh, Okay. Uh, I love this kind of thing of going within uh, machine learning stuff and so on, and uh, this, you see, for example, in the past, that uh, non-response was analyzed using, say, logistic models. Then there were the, but we realized re rapidly that if you use model like Chade and so on, those approaches that was segmenting the, the data, it was much easier and so on, and you were able to pick up really nice thing out of the non-response process. But here it's the same kind of thing. You're using machine learning in order to build up some models in order, uh, not models, but build up basically the information to go to, for doing the amputation. Now, the, the thing that we need to be careful with is the fact that if you, if you don't have a clue exactly what's going on in the process, meaning that here you have a mar machine learning process, yes, with weights and so on, very good approach, by the way, and then you run the thing, you get a result, great. The thing is that the next time for the next survey or the next year, if you're blindly re redoing the process, if something changed somewhere, the data, the nature of the data, you might get totally different results. And then you have a problem. First of all, you have a problem to explain what's going on. The guys that are looking at the data and so on, they will scratch their head and say, what the heck are you doing? You see, you change everything, and then you need to be able to answer what happened. And this is, so maybe my advice would be, if you use machine learning one year, great. But the year, next year, try to be consistent with the previous year on the results or the way that you impute. Because otherwise, the imputation will go all over the place and nobody will know what will going on. Maybe for this particular time, it will be the best imputation that you could get. But if the imputation is totally different, from what you were having before, then you have a problem. So this, this were my. This were okay, comments. I'm gonna let the authors respond. Okay. Um, um, you have resumed the, well, we have, a, we are trading bias versus variability in the situation uh, uh, presented. And um, instead of calling efficiency, I could uh, use, uh, uh, because we, uh, we involve uh, in the process two, the two components of, of mean square error, instead of talking about efficiency is better, uh, I think uh, uh, the correct term is um, accuracy, including uh, the two terms. And, um, uh, I think that uh, one possibility when we have no uh, supervised, uh, a supervised uh, source uh, is uh, the important is to stress uh, the concept of, of um, ol uh, holistic uh, approach in which also uh, the joint uh, uh, work uh, joining the um, joining the experience of aspect of area with uh, together with the methodologists uh, should be uh, increased in order when we do not in order to validate uh, how to put the data but uh, 
for me, the sol solution is to better, because, uh, because of we have the possibility to invest on quality of the survey, it is better to reduce uh, sample sites uh, of the survey in order to get uh, a higher level of quality in the survey, in order, uh, because we uh, can driven the process uh, and we uh, try, at least try, to check, to control the process uh, having uh, um, a reference point, a reference data. So we should invest more in quality of the survey, at least reducing uh, its uh, sample size. But in order to get uh, a more accurate data, in this way, uh, we uh, could also uh, take advantage of uh, a non-propagatistic data, at least at uh, area level, or uh, like uh, at least uh, using this uh, for uh, non-probabilistic data for uh, uh, auxiliary variables or so on. But this could be a possible choice, a, a possible uh, try to answer. Okay, Romina, do you want to address the comment? Okay. Um, yes, uh, so with this uh, experimentation, we wanted to uh, study the gain in efficiency of the uh, machine learning approach. So that's true. Uh, we, now we want uh, uh, statistics as soon as possible. So we tried. In, the first, in our experimentation, to put all the variable in the machine learning approach to see what uh, what happens to the results. So that's true. We have seen that the results are um, not the optimal result when we do not have when we do uh, no, uh, any pre-process to the data. We obtain uh, a good result, but they are not the optimal result. So we cannot prevent the some kind of data pre-processing. Uh, the experimentation was um, cross-sectional, so we um, have tried only one uh, year. So that's uh, the next year probably uh, we will uh, we will try again with uh, machine learning on new uh, data, and we will see what uh, what will uh, happen. But maybe the, we do not uh, may not have a coherence uh, between uh, in the same individual over time for this. But it, this indeed happens also for the log linear imputation. So. Since now we do just uh, cross-sectional estimates to reproduce the distribution observed in the census sample. And uh, in the future, we want to uh, experiment the use of uh, machine learning in order and the longitudinal data of the um, previous experimentation to see if we want, uh, if we can also um, arrive to uh, coherence over time. The, since, since now we just have uh, worked uh, cross-sectional, uh, we have in mind to do other experimentation on this topic. Okay, thank you. Let's raise another point uh, in back, and then David. Oh, sorry. I was first? Yes, sorry, sorry, yeah. There, okay, three. First one is more a general comment for Stefano. Actually, tries to put together the first contribution in the first session and in this session. We've been talking a lot in these um, committees about the issues of estimating from the new system of registers and population census. And I was thinking before, and I was even thinking during your second um, talk, that uh, we got to the point that we know we need models within mass imputation, and we know the role of registers. And I think we can now, in a sense, go back <laughs> to a more naive and maybe fundamental question of sampling and the role of sampling. Now I think we're ready for that. We've been stuck with two-stage clusters because of personal copy and because th there was no information, no frame, no information here. But I think now everything has changed, and we can 
go back of thinking maybe we don't need two stage anymore. We can just go Kawi and then just go. So your second talk was really going, I thought it was a naive comment, but then when I've heard your presentation, I think that's something, even the application on um, educational attainment. You have that 5% that is really the hardcore. I mean, the other is okay. You can just go even for, with a simple model. But predicting that 5%, so you may think of oversampling that 5%. You can think of using your sample to really tackle the issues that you have left in your registers in your new system. And then I have a few questions for Romina. The first would be that have you seen you're trying to diminish human intervention, intervention but with um, machine learning, humans are needed maybe even more than with classical models, I think. So if I got your results correctly, the, the all-in is worse than the one in which you do have your uh, some data pre-processing, as you said. I was wondering whether you have results on the comparison between weighted and unweighted MLP. And the, the other thing is you are weighting the loss. Why don't you just weight uh, the estimating equation? that would make it more similar to the classical Orbis-Thompson situation. Because the estimating equation is like a population total. If you, estim if you weight the estimating equation on the sample, it's like uh, an Orbis-Thompson estimate of the population level estimating equation, while the loss is like uh, a floor up. <laughs> so it's before you take like a derivative. So maybe there would be. And then, but this is just a curiosity, when you needed to repeat the, the procedure a hundred times. What do you need to do that? Isn't it that the model is always the same? What do you need to do it a hundred times? Five no, fivefold is okay, yeah. but then it's so ten. The the Not on. Uh, okay. Can I answer just? Okay. Do you want to answer Romina and then and keep it short so we can <laughs> have more questions? Okay. Yes, that, um, we, we follow with a K-fold approach, and so we repeated, the, um, we divided this, the population of interest into five subgroups, and then we repeated this process, uh, all the process, uh, the estimation process, 100 times. This was to take into account the variability of the model. This means that uh, we um, assign a from the distribution uh, 100 times, so we pick up uh, from the distribution 100 times the 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 ale. Is and uh, as regards uh, the the other question, what about uh, weights? Uh, yes, we have in our first experimentation, we do uh, we did uh, all the experimentation without uh, weights without weights, so the, we didn't use weights in the model, and we comp in this case, we compared the output distribution with the not weighted uh, sample. And in this case, we obtained very um, similar results to those obtained with the weighted uh, uh, approach, and maybe also a uh, better result. But it is, this is not our aim, so we, we do not want to reproduce the uh, distribution observed in the census sample if this distribution is not weighted. We want to reproduce the weighted uh, distribution. And uh, we have uh, also other, we have done also other uh, comparison. So we um, compared the, the unweighted model the results obtained with the unweighted model with the, with the weighted distribution. And in this case, uh, weight act differently in the sense that if we um, apply weights on uh, uh, the first experimentation of MLP, um, so when we made the choice of the input variables, then the use of the weights improve the, the, the quality of the, the, the accuracy obtained. But in the last experiment, the second experimentation, in the, when we do not pre-process uh, the input variables, weights act um, differently. That this means that uh, uh, the unweighted with respect to the weighted was, uh, uh, was better. 
that that's because when we consider weights on uh, variables that uh, are um, row variables are not uh, uh, controlled variables, then there may be an, um, some uh, um, uh, misinterpretation of the relationship between the target variable and the, and the input variables. And uh, okay, thank you. We'll leave it at that. Do you want to address uh, the comment? Uh, okay, uh, I agree with you. I think that uh, in um, many contexts, uh, the, this new type of uh, production process, uh, we should uh, gain more compenetration am among different capabilities and uh, competences uh, around the table of the multi-source process. Uh, um, starting from the definition of the target uh, um, uh, of the survey through design and elaboration phases, uh, uh, passing for, uh, for data collection through validation phase, because uh, the process is, is more com pro complex and the different uh, actor in the planning and realization phase need to be more uh, uh, knowing uh, the other phases. In this, case, in this, in this context, we could get um, a more, uh, uh, we could plan more process of more quality. And uh, one, uh, the, the, your suggestion is in this, uh, in this, uh, in this line, I think. As a general comment, if I have get your uh, suggestion. Okay, thank you. So the microphone went here, and then it'll go there, and then it'll go to David, and that'll be it. <laughs> okay. Uh, so first of all, just a curiosity for Romino. Just a curiosity, because in slide 10 and 11, actually, you evaluate the result at the micro level or macro level, and you obtain completely different result, opposite result. If you have any clue on what is going on, just to give us an idea on the process, because actually I don't know the technique very well, so just to have an idea of what's going on, if you have it. And then, yeah, uh, thanks to Mr. Burke uh, about your presentation. I really liked it, and actually, I want to say that uh, the, the slide about the big data process, uh, the quality evaluation linked to big data processes actually is uh, linked to the um, total error process, uh, where basically we try to uh, see where the errors come from during the process. And actually, I think in the first part of the process, uh, uh, using different sources, there is always a moment where we have to evaluate the cost of transport the external data to statistical data. So both big data, administrative data, whatever data, actually we have to transform them in some way, so both objects and units. Actually, we have some literature also from uh, uh, Lee Chung that is here, and also from Marietta Lutz, et cetera. And actually, we have this moment that is crucial for official statistics, because actually we, we need to transform information, and we really have to evaluate that moment that could be critical and uh, uh, cause many problems in our processes. And then the last thing is, um, I appreciated also, uh, it was very interesting, all the topics, but uh, uh, the, the work from uh, De Gregorio. Uh, and uh, actually, uh, instead of, I also like his idea of anticipating, uh, using register to anticipate in some way the, the information, but actually what I, I, I observe from this phenomenon is that actually we have such good information, or at least we have stable information on a very big part of our population, usually. That is 95 percentage here. Today we had two examples of these situations, so both occupational status and attaining level. 
And then we have many problems on 5% of information of our population. So actually, why don't we start to use, at least from an experimental point of view, uh, the data and uh, sample data and register in order to focus on this part of population. So try to use the samples in order to understand what's going on where we don't have any other information in, in, in such a way of trying to get uh, hints on what's, in go what's going on on uh, the part of the population where we really miss something. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's take another question and then we'll ask our panelists to address. So, two questions, one to Romina. Um, um, there are two aspects on your presentation that I was not able to connect, so maybe you can clarify. The first dimension is uh, manual versus automated processing of imputation. And I think it should be more automated. I agree with, with you. Also because I think that more automation it does not contradict or reduce the human learning that Mr. De Gregorio mentioned before. I will touch on this tomorrow morning. I hope both of you will be there to elaborate on this. But anyway, one dimension is automation. The other one is whether we should use model log linear or machine learning or any of, uh, of our other tools. But the two things are orthogonal, in my opinion. You can also automate log linear. You don't need to have machine learning in order to have more automation. And from your conclusion, it seems more or less implicit that you need you go to machine learning in order to automate. This I don't buy, so I would like to have a clarification on this. I think we should automate also the log linear if we consider log linear to be to be to be a good option. The other question was to Falorsi. Um, interesting your slide, no? So this is taken from a well-known paper. Would you prefer an, a, a data set with 80% coverage that is known, obviously, to be biased because of self-reporting, or a survey that is unbiased with 60% coverage? I think the answer is a no-brainer. But maybe the question that captures a bit better the reality is slightly different. Would you prefer no, is the choice is not between a, a data set that is clearly biased, obviously biased because of uh, self-report, and a data set that was meant to be unbiased <laughs> because it was a sample, uh, sam uh, sample survey, but because of a very low and likely unbiased response rate, because of a response bias, happens to be biased as well, hopefully in a different way as the other data set. I think this was the... I think the intervention um, that, that you made before, right? And, and so the question is not never between a purely unbiased and a, a biased samples, but it's between different data sources that one is, is a clearly and strongly biased, the other one is probably biased in a way that uh, we still have to understand better. And maybe you don't have to choose between them, joining them together. Uh, by you know playing on the diversity of the bias mechanism is probably the best that you can do given the current situation. So um, I'm wondering whether maybe maybe in certain fields having unbiased data set is realistic, but maybe not all surveys can be assumed to deliver unbiased results due to uh, non non-response bias. So wouldn't that be this question, this way of looking, you know, uh, would capture better the, the reality um, in your opinion? Thanks. Um, okay, let's have, Thomas, did you want to say anything? And then we'll, and then we'll address the questions and then we'll go to David for the last Yes, uh, thank you very much for your comment. And I totally agree that we have this very important moment when the things come together. To total error, I think this is a little bit problematic. i following the discussion since a long time about this total survey error paradigm as we had it. And I think uh, I'm a little bit skeptical that we really can arrive here to something like a compound error system which we can then compose a total error. Things are so different. Things are very much uh, a part of each other from assessing in quality. So I would rather say that we should 
tackle and communicate the errors in a separate way, so to especially to users and especially for producers. But I think, uh, of course, it is very valuable to have more research in this topic and to to see in how far the error components can be brought together in a, in, a, in, a, in a specific way, but not to come to a, let me say, single single, single mythical number, which, which then describes the whole error of the product. I think so I'm a little bit skeptical in that way, but that's my personal opinion. Also following a long time this uh, total error survey paradigm discussions. Okay, do you want to address the comment and then we'll move to okay. Right okay. Uh, thank you. The, um, the answer is um, uh, the problem is open. So uh, in the paper, um, I stress um, that we are in, in a multiple, in a multi-source uh, um, context in which we um, give uh, uh, to the different uh, um, sources arising from uh, sample or administrative data, uh, different level or uh, sort of hierarchy. For example, in the, um, considering the attained level of the education, we, um, we consider uh, the the administrative data uh, opportunely, uh, uh, properly uh, treated in a statistical way, as we have seen in the presentation, as uh, uh, the primary source of data because the definition of the variable and also the quality level, the, the quality indicators, uh, uh, related to this variable and also to related to coverage uh, of the overall population of uh, in good enough quality to be produced directly uh, from uh, uh, register-based uh, statistics. In this case, uh, sample uh, data that are collected uh, um, are collected are used to um, to fill the, the missing information related to subpopulation, unavailable subpopulation. So we use together, as you uh, uh, use together, the two pieces of information, so not uh, giving a sort of a hierarchy um, guided from the knowledge of the quality, of an overall knowledge of that we can do. In another process related to, for example, uh, an employment, employed, unemployed, we do not have uh, such uh, st strong uh, evidence about administrative data, but we consider the uh, administrative data coming from uh, um, on em employment uh, very correlated with the phenomena uh, under study, but we lacking for uh, um, uh, some pieces of information related, not uh, the same definition or uh, we have not as, as correlation. So we are in a context in which we met to consider together the, the two sampling survey, labor force and uh, master sample, uh, together with administrative data in a context of uh, um, uh, Latin, class, um, Latin class model. Um, in this case, none of the different information is uh, prevalent, and we try to, uh, to, to treat the different information in a different way. So uh, we are in context of multi-source, and uh, um, we are, um, this is my general comment, it depends on the situation. So I can not give a, a general rule, but also um, improving the quality of the survey, reducing the sample sites, uh, in many cases 
and, and could be uh, an important improvement uh, in, in one of, for this context. So for example, planning for given population, like was uh, suggesting uh, um, Professor John Aranalli about uh, a tenant level of uh, education and so on. So it depends, uh, I think, on the situation. Okay, finally, Romina. Okay. So first, a comment on the automation of the process. So um, the first time uh, we, the first result on the attained level of education were published in uh, 2018, and uh, the official procedure used was those uh, of the log linear model. And uh, but to arrive uh, to that, uh, to, to um, arrive to the process, to finalize the process, we implied about one year to study uh, the possible uh, sources, all the sources, all the um, characteristics of our data set, uh, which uh, variable could be used uh, in the model to obtain the best uh, prediction. Uh, so uh, at the end, we, mm, uh, we find that the best uh, model was uh, by dividing the subpopulation, the population into subpopulations. So different log linear models were uh, were uh, um, estimated for each subpopulation. So uh, to arrive at the uh, official procedure, we spent a lot uh, of time to to analyze uh, the data. So this uh, motivated our study on the use of alternative uh, approaches. Now the log linear imputation, that is the official procedure, is indeed uh, is automated. So yes, <laughs> that's, uh, that's true. But uh, we... Mm, uh, and we think that these, these experimentations are important also for um, uh, future estimation. We want to analyze also other variables, for example, um, the uh, um, people that are attaining a course, so to um, estimate the students. So we may... Um, think to use machine learning techniques, for example. But uh, yes, we have seen that uh, they can produce, if we, want, if we need uh, very quick uh, statistics, then we can, we can use machine learning. Then we need time to um, optimize the, estimate, the estimation that we obtain. I th think that this is true in both cases, standard and uh, also machine learning. As regards machine learning, uh, we need um, um, the cooperation between different skills. So we need also uh, ex uh, computer scientists, experts, and uh, information technologists. Uh, yeah, that's just a, a general comment, I think. And as uh, regards uh, the um, difference between micro and macro accuracy, yes, um, in uh, micro accuracy, we may obtain a good micro accuracy, as uh, we, we have seen in uh, multilayer perceptron. We obtain a good uh, micro level accuracy and a not so good macro level accuracy. That's why um, the, the um, extreme case is when we impute, for example, using the modal uh, value. When you impute using uh, the modal value of the distribution, your mi micro accuracy may be the, the best. Uh, micro accuracy that you can obtain because in this uh, specific profile of uh, population you the um, great part of individual have uh, a specific uh, modality of the tenant level of education and if you impute all the individual in that uh, subpopulation with the modal value you obtain the um, high micro level accuracy but the macro level accuracy is uh, completely completely wrong so it is uh, this is not true that it is not always true that to a micro level high micro level accuracy you can uh, um, you can have a, a good macro level accuracy but when you impute a wrong uh, uh, a value that is not the, the true the true value for the subpopulation that you um, uh, impute with the true 
uh, value, you have a, uh, the micro uh, accuracy is uh, is okay. For the other, you, but you don't know when you are wrong how you uh, mm, distribute your wrong uh, uh, modality. So I hope to have answered the, the question. Okay, thank you. Thank you, David. Did you want to ask a question? So I had a, I take the opportunity to ask questions as well. So first of all, when you talk about, you know, um, unbiased small size sample versus a very biased large, I mean, you are assuming, of course, that you're working really hard to mitigate those biases. Like, you, you know, probably have in your admin data, your cleaning, your coverage weights, no? You're not using them as, as uh, so I would hope that there's, uh, you're mitigating those biases before you use them. And then the other question, I'm, I'm a bit concerned, uh, you know, about sort of machine learning. Well, I'm not concerned, but I mean, how do we incorporate those new methods in our quality frameworks, you know, which are all about interpretability and explainability, you know, it's really, it's, you know, we're more accustomed to explaining a log linear model and versus something that with this, uh, you know, neural network. So, how do we think about um, expanding our quality frameworks to take into account these new methods? Um, or is there even a need to do that? Yes, uh, thank you uh, for this question about integrating into quality frameworks. I think it is very important uh, to have this experimental stage for all these methods. Yeah. What then is needed is a, re a really well-designed and standardized process for bringing experimental statistics into the official portfolio. This has to be developed, I think. Some kind of checklist, some, guide or some, some kind of process, how to bring it, or some kind of criteria, how to bring it to the official portfolio. If there is a need uh, to expand really the quality framework in terms of changing the definition of quality in official statistics, I'm not sure. Maybe only only with this uh, in the accuracy dimension where we have uh, this kind of non-sampling errors. So maybe there would be a need. Uh, <clears throat> we have their model model assumption errors as one part, but maybe there is a need. To, to, to have something extended a little bit like, uh, don't know now, this artificial intelligence uh, things. But uh, I think there, is, there, there might be a need, but I, I do not think that it is necessary to expand it. Uh, <clears throat> maybe what is needed is, what I already said in the previous session, is to, to be a little bit more communicative to, to users or to, to, to improve here the, 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 the message a little bit told to the users in the, in, within the quality reporting systems. Because for, for, for producers it's much more easier because they, they more understand. So for producer-oriented quality reports, I think there's no need. But for user-oriented quality reports, there's a need to improve a little bit, I think. OK. And, and the statistical... Uh bag of tools for the statistician. We have uh, uh, different tools for uh, reducing uh, also in, for a sample survey. We have different tools for reducing uh, try, not to expect to reduce bias uh, with reference to no response or no covered correction bias. Uh, uh, at least using uh, all the available information in order to uh, act on the sampling weights, uh, in order to uh, make a correction on weights and to evaluate sampling errors uh, for different uh, breakdowns or domains of interest that could be at least uh, marginal domains for which we may take under control the sampling errors. On the other hand, uh, on the uh, information coming from, from administrative regis, uh, administrative data, if we have to introduce model, I agree um, with uh, David, uh, with the suggestion of David of uh, uh, 
to increase the, um, the tools uh, uh, and also the statistical tools in order to better validate uh, our data. So uh, this is uh, um, an, uh, an, uh, an, um, it is not possible to not consider this, uh, these steps uh, um, before to, uh, to melt or to uh, integrate uh, together data because uh, this is part of also for sample survey I could also increase the quality of the survey in order to uh, sub-sample non-respondent uh, units in order to have some evidence at least small but of, of high quality from uh, no respondents. So these are the, the tools uh, in, in the bag of the statistician in order to <laughs> try to, to overcome uh, or partially to try to overcome the problem. So, okay. This is So uh, as regards the, the um, quality dimension uh, for the machine learning, we just consider the accuracy of the results. So we do not, uh, uh, we don't have uh, thought since now to a, a framework, a specific framework to um, expand the, the quality dimension. Maybe this is a need for the future if these uh, machine learning techniques uh, will be introduced in the official production but we will uh, have to think about this. Okay, is there any other comments, questions from the audience? Li Chan. Wait, we won't be able to hear you without the microphone. Design-based machine learning. Design-based machine learning. So if you have a different sample, your predictors, your errors will be different. So you evaluate all these errors over repeated sample where the population Y, X, or hold fixed, just like design-based framework. This can be done for, for population total estimations. So we have a paper with Luis Sanguel Sander, uh, exactly design unbiased machine learning assisted estimation. Okay, just change your linear model with your neural networks, you get population unbiased estimates. So, theory has been developed. More recently, together with Daniel Lee, we have a paper on design based individual prediction. So, if you are interested in micro level prediction, this also can be guided by design based. So, as long as the situation is such that you do have a probability sample to start with to do your machine learning, this thing is sorted. This thing is sorted. Okay, the problem comes when you do not have probably sample to start with in a context of multi-source. You just have data sets available, admin this and that, but you don't really have. That is when the model-based inference, model-based sort of ways of doing things still necessary. Is that acceptable? I think uh, if you are doing this on a, on a sort of ad hoc basis, that's maybe okay. But if you are in a national official statistical program and so on, maybe you want some greater assurance and that is the perspective i think we'll talk tomorrow too in terms of big data it's a broad perspective called audit sampling inference so you do some probability sampling but only to assess the error you, you design based error assessment it doesn't really matter if your estimators are model based algorithm or dreamed of it doesn't really matter <laughs> i'm going to assess the design based error using sampling theory so instead of using sampling to estimate the total, I'm going to estimate the sampling to estimate your error of your estimate. That will provide a valid sort of error estimation and that it can circumvent all the problems, philosophical complications about the zero true models. Do we, can we do sort of error free learnings or these things? Okay, all these things gone. You can, if your neural network estimate beats the design based estimates, go ahead with respect to design based errors. Of course, unbiasedness is maybe an issue, but it's just how you accept the errors and so on. So all these things I think are going front. So bringing back to the sampling, the technique, the universality of sampling idea, right? I can provide some valid inference, no matter 
what population is. That's Neiman's to start with this concept, right? That's validity thing. I think we have lots of contribute, especially from the sort of official statistical perspective, when this where this kind of validity is desirable. I mean, if you are interested in the validity in a sort of nuanced way, you can live with model-based validity too. But the question, if you if it's really desirable with this kind of descriptive black-white type of validity, then sampling, we can come back and do a lot of things, I think. Okay, uh, thanks to all the comments on the paper machine learning that Romina was <laughs> had to answer so for all the others. So coming back to the last comment, uh, mm, uh, if I got the problem, you said that uh, we have to, in a sense, look at design properties and design-based properties and so, a kind of design based and so on. But uh, probably uh, this is, uh, in general, uh, this is a question that should be posed more in general than machine learning. When you integrate, uh, we need to ask ourselves if we really want to focus on design property, design based properties, because th th we could, as in a model based approach, we could. Uh, uh, focus on model-based uh, properties, on design-based properties, and you said that design has these nice properties. That's true in a, in a sense, but these properties uh, relies on, uh, um, let's say, on uh, um, consist on large uh, on the property of large large numbers of uh, observations. In a sense, are asymptotical. No, in a, they are. Or, or on the average, all the, the if you go in a small, for instance, if if you go in a small domains, you need to uh, look at uh, model for uh, modeling, and you should look at that uh, property. So it is not so clear uh, when you integrate and when you go into the details, because we are going into the details of micro units. So. I don't know, probably it is a little bit different context than we used to work on before. That is an open question going forward, right? Because in all other business, take weather report. What is the validity? Nobody is jumping up and down saying, no, we cannot do this. We can, but there is the operation like science, no problem, right? So it's not design-based validity. You can, you can have a bigger picture of validity in head, but until this culture change happens in official statistics, the one you can rely on, which ensure people is the design, and you have technique to do that. So this is the question to say, if you need some uh, acceptable, acceptant sort of validity measures, we can do that. But of course, at the same time, you know, time will change. People's mind will change. Yes, of course, in future, we may move to a situation we will accept another type of validity. But that requires a lot of other changes to take place at the same time. You cannot just say, because you had a algorithm, so therefore I can accept that. There's more other things has to come, right? The procedural transparency, the, all these protocols, and all, how we do it. All these total things has to change. That will take time. But we, we, we don't want to say that this is the only way we see things today. That's the only type of validity we can accept. And in future, it will still maintain like this. No, things will change, I'm sure. But at the moment, I'm just saying that if the, the question arises, you do want this type of accepted type of validity, yes, we can do it. That's the methodological answer. Yes, we can do it. Thank you. And on, on that note, I think we'll close the session and thank all the speakers and all the audience who asked um, great questions. Thank you very much.
And thanks also to all the people that attended online. There, are, there have been at least 80 people, if I'm not wrong, uh, connected online and attending the, this workshop. So thank you very much to all of them. And we will meet again at uh, 2.30, about, for the afternoon session, where we will be uh, the masterclass uh, by Professor Aziza. Thank you very much.